Hello, ako po si Robbie Alampay, Puma Podcast, and in this episode, we get a glimpse of an answer to this question. What happens if humans were to disappear from this earth? I think I got a very clear, up close, and personal view at the answer. Kasi, at the end of 2022, we, my family and I, we went on an African safari. Safaris were practically dead for two years during the COVID pandemic. When lockdowns were ordered in Kenya and Tanzania, overnight and then for two years, the plant and animal kingdoms were suddenly rid of all of us. So what happened? Ito, hint. When apparently nobody misses you, it's humbling. And it will remind you of everything you did and stood for before you disappeared. I know two things as we start. One, I will try to share with you what we saw, what we heard, how it felt. And then I also know I will fail in that effort. For example, let's start with the most basic thing to understand. The African savanna is unlucky. And you still don't know what I mean. Subukan nyo to. Tandaan nyo to para hindi ako pa ulit-ulit. As we go along on this tour, when I describe grasslands, a plain, a lake, a lake bed, a desert, rolling hills, a line of migrating wildebeest, imagine and hear me prefacing everything I will describe with as far as the eye can see. And yet, with every turn, our safari seemed to drive to one inevitable point. As invisible and inconsequential as we may feel, all of us leave our mark on this land. We visited a Maasai village. What you're hearing, in fact, is a dozen Maasai men chanting as they performed their ritual jumping dance. The chief of the village, he told us to call him Chief Ben, told us of the Maasai's history and fate, both intertwined with the land. It's a complicated story, like that of any indigenous peoples, with its tragic struggles and episodes, its history of resistance and politics, a culture defined by what they had hoped would be peaceful coexistence with nature, and that ultimately could not escape a tenuous relationship with modern human aspirations. The Maasai deserve their own long conversation. But for now, for this episode, this is about the land. I just wanted to start with them. Because this famous, iconic jumping ritual, they've long had it, Sabine Chief Ben, but it's become a much more central rite of passage for their young men because, well, the old rite of passage back when the Maasai were free to roam the Mara with their grazing stock of cows, goats, and sheep, the old ritual was to kill a lion. Killing animals, as the Maasai acknowledge, and as you all already know, is unfortunately generally unsustainable. Commercial safaris themselves used to be about hunting. Nowadays, thankfully, most of the shooting in the savanna are done with smartphones and cameras, although there are still private game reserves where people can pay to seasonally, quote, hunt for, quote, game, that are nowadays, quote, less endangered. In any case, the Maasai made the first point in our tour, that when it comes to people, human progress, and everything in nature coming together, something's got to give. Usually, it's nature. And so at some point, humans need to recognize that some things simply have to change, or else things, like the climate, surely will change. If you've ever thought that you are too small to have any lasting impact on the planet, the African savanna is a fantastic place to wallow deeper in that delusion. Nabanggit ko, di ba, na malaki. Now, picture this. Quezon City, the biggest city in Metro Manila, is 161 square kilometers. 
kasama na dyan ang Lamesa Watershed. The Masai Mara National Reserve in Kenya, the first reservation we visited on our safari, is 1,500 square kilometers. So this park is nearly nine times the size of Quezon City, where I'm recording this. From the Mara, we followed the Great Rift Valley, crossed into Tanzania, and then toured the Serengeti National Park. That one, Serengeti, is nearly 10 times the Masai Mara, 14,700 square kilometers. Buhay ka pa? The Serengeti National Park is more than 90 times the size of Quezon City. Eliud was our able guide in Kenya at the Mara. In Tanzania, for the Serengeti, Eliud handed us over to his colleague, Augustine. And then Augustine drove us back to Kenya, and we ended our nine-day tour again with Eliud, touring the Amboseli Park. That one was small, just twice the size of Quezon City. Between our two new friends, over nine days we drove more than 1,000 kilometers through grasslands, the Great Rift Valley, by the Amboseli Lake, marshes and deserts. Hmm, now you understand, as far as I can see. We crossed streams. With every photo, we checked off every animal off the top of your head right now. Elephants, oh, oh we saw that. Giraffes, oh, oh, near, far. Zebras, sawaka. Hippos, hyenas, puppies, gazelles, every type of antelope. Vultures, every kind of bird we don't know the name of. Everybody asked, did you see the big five? Yes, we did. Although it's not actually what we thought. People think that the big five either refers to size or to how rare an animal is. I thought the big five were the big cats. Lion, leopard, cheetah, and then I realized I know African cats. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Augustine explained that all of that is wrong. Hey, okay. rhino, okay, let me start. Rhino, buffaloes, uh, le lion, leopard, and um, elephant. The big you know, five of, refers you know, to value, not necessarily the most expensive, before, you know, but basically uh, it lists five animals that had been hunted for something of theirs that people and wanted. Like uh, lions and leopard, they are killed because of their skin and buffalo for the meat, rhino for the horn, elephant for the tusk. Because hippo is bigger than buffalo, but it's not in the big five. And so we saw elephants alone or in groups, we saw lions on the prowl, we saw warthogs, we saw a huge herd of water buffalo surrounding a lioness that seemed careless because yeah, we, we saw the evidence that she and her pride had already eaten. Monkeys on trees, where weaver birds were building nests, hoping to impress prospective mates. Vultures on trees, leopards on trees. There were more than a few times when our vehicle would converge with 20 or 30 other groups on a rare sighting of a black rhino no nearer than 150 meters to our intrusion. We saw a cheetah lying lazily on a termite mound that you could barely make out with binoculars. And a few hours later, another cheetah with a cub looking bored as a lone zebra came within 20 feet of it. All of them very alert. In fact, they were facing each other, but all very cool and nonchalant. They probably would have been perplexed by how locked in us humans were on the tedium of this non-event. If safaris were to stop for even just a week, Elliot said, the van-trampled roads that crisscrossed the savanna would disappear. And I was wondering about that when I asked about COVID. I asked how the pandemic affected their livelihood, but also how it affected the animals that for two years had no humans intruding on their home. What happens, as we said, when humans disappear? Before COVID, how many tourists did Kenya get? About 2 million. And then during COVID? Uh, the year 2020, like it was like almost zero. 
So that was for the humans, but what was the effect on the animals, on the animal population? The animal population uh, was either normal or just, um, you know, came up a little bit. We, you don't intervene in the population anyway? No, we don't. We just let nature to take its own course. That's it. Even the government, even the... Apparently, even the if you take people out of the picture, parks, everything else about life on Earth just goes on. Just leave nature to take its own course. Okay. Yes. No recording will capture how it feels. It doesn't do my own memory justice. This was around 6 a.m. Every morning at the Masai Mara in the Serengeti, we woke up to this. In the evenings, crickets, hyenas, zebras, hippos, some in the distance, some down in the river, some just outside of our tents, would join in the cacophony. You would think and wish that the world is indeed resilient morning comes every day as promised. As we drove through the Amboseli, however, Eliud showed us the effects of climate change. The region had experienced a severe drought. Carcasses of zebras, giraffes, and water buffaloes littered the road like fallen soldiers. And Eliud said that because the animals were not fully scavenged, they still had their skin. In, in, in parts, you could so see areas, the pelt and the stripes. Side, it was a sign there that is more water too than, uh, many on this had side. died. Mm -hmm. yes. So the other areas you will find more carcasses than here. Um, right now, how many have we seen? I think we've seen about five. Um, and it's about, uh, I would say, about four kilometers since we left the gate. And, and, and about five carcasses. So could be even more and those are the ones that are on the road yeah. there are others uh, which are inside uh, yes that we don't even see for months scavengers were having feasts but they literally could not finish it so, all but now it's i mean we're in Amboseli now yes clearly it's very it's much much drier than what we saw in Masai Mara and uh, Serengeti, Serengeti yes. right yes. but is this has it always been like this? I mean, this is I, 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 Amboseli is really a drier region than. Uh, it's, it's generally a drier region. Yeah. But uh, this time round, it is more drier than it's supposed to be. Okay. Yes, because uh, for the last uh, two years we didn't have good rains at all. Yes. Like uh, in every ten years, we'll be having like about two two years of uh, dry spell. Very very. Um, severe drought. Every 10 years? Every 10 right. years, about 2 years will be uh, drought. Uh, yes. And that's more frequent than before? Yes, that's more frequent because uh, early alone it was like uh, 20 years a uh, drought. But right now... 20 years between droughts? Yes, yeah. Eliud also spoke so of Mount Kilimanjaro. But the highest compared, peak in this uh, region, Amboseli and how its snow uh, cap was melting uh, at an alarming Masai rate. Its water was feeding new marshes. The marshes were causing acacia roots to rot, and the trees would die, depriving elephants and giraffes especially of an important, almost exclusive yeah. source. Now, early alone, Amboseli was uh, full of these kind of trees. Or the, uh, or each and every area had uh, these uh, acacia trees, but we don't have any more. It's only a handful of them that you see right now. Because um, the other factor is now water logging in the area because we have hard pan, like, like uh, something rocky. So when it rains, the water doesn't penetrate completely down. It will be this area will be locked with water. So if the, uh, there there is uh, water logging and then. Uh, the trees have uh, spreading roots. Hmm. The, the roots get spoiled and uh, the tree dies. Aspects that, uh, Eliud you know, said the in there is so water where there elephants, shouldn't be elephants. no water where it should. And where water shows up, it is the wrong water for the wrong soil. As we were driving along the Amboseli, continuing our conversation, three Maasai children came running alongside our slow driving van. They were shouting. You can actually hear them in the background here. 
I personally didn't notice them at first. But when I did, I couldn't understand what they were saying. Let's, let's play that again. Maybe you could hear it clearer than I do. I asked Elliot what they were saying. They are asking for water. They are asking for water. You miss a lot when you're not paying attention. The trip was eye-opening with that message. Elliot spoke to us thoughtfully about what was inescapable despite the whole point of us being here precisely to escape. I told Elliot, you know, we don't have an actual translation of climate change in our language. Not in any of our languages. Not that I know. It's not in Filipino, not in Visaya. We all just keep saying climate change. I said I think that's unfortunate. Because climate change, Dibai, eh, why? for me, it sounds so neutral, so benign. But I cannot just keep saying global warming also. And that much we could translate, diba? Ang pag-init ng mundo. Mas malakas ang dating. But climate change is bigger and more complex than that. Maybe, I said, if we could convey it well in our mother tongue, maybe we could also better capture the urgency for our everyday lives and the future our children will inherit. Is it it's it's mabadriko ya hari ya hewa mabadriko is change yeah is off hari is the situation hewa is climate again mabadriko ya hari ya hewa even if it's not officially done people will have their own uh, local language uh, observation and the terms, mm -hmm. even if it's not official. Mm -hmm. I think it's always good to, you know, to, for everyone to know the climate change in their own uh, local languages, mm -hmm. so that at least we can uh, look for remedies, mm -hmm. how to deal with it. Niva? Yes. Ikaw, how would you translate climate change into your mother tongue? As we drove along the dry lake bed of Amboseli, let me just repeat here, the dry lake stretched as far as the eye can see. I wondered, of course, where the water was. Now, to the right here, this is uh, Lake Amboseli. Eliud literally meant that yes, we were driving by the, the banks of the lake, okay. just two meters away from the road. Yeah, yes, to the right here. It's a dry lake. But, uh, but where was the water's edge? It was dry. I could make out some shimmering line of light near the horizon. I pointed it out to Eliud and my family. Look, sabi ko, look, the poor animals would have to trudge all the way to what remains in that pathetic pool way out there near the horizon. See, Eliud, still driving, looked to his right to where my hands and for extra precision, my lips were pointing. That's not what. Uh, it's a mirage. But, did you uh, very soon we'll did, get, uh, did you get that? Did, did you get what Elliot said? Like here? Yeah. That's mirage. That little pool and all that it represented in my mind, Elliot said. That's a mirage. No, I don't want to end on that note. Let's still end with real hope. Because honestly, that's still our ultimate takeaway from the safari. It was a journey of awe and inspiration, great understanding, greater desire to understand, to learn. And there, in being dumbfounded, there in the savanna, where a sense of majesty intersects with humility and contrition, it's impossible to not dream and hope. So let's end again as we started and ended each day in the savannah. Listen to this. And as it did with us, imagine waking up to this. And then let it take you to this. Let your focus drift to this bird in particular. Sometimes I feel I already know this bird. In fact, I wonder if it missed us. Hmm, that's right, guess what? 
Surprise! We're back in Quezon City. I recorded this just outside our window in Tandansora. My daily morning friend reminding us, you miss a lot when you're not paying attention. Thank you for joining me in this trip. Muli ako po si Robbie Alampay, Puma Podcast para sa Teka Teka. Subscribe to Teka Teka and Puma Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you podcast. You can also now catch us on YouTube. Follow us too on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and even TikTok. Thank you for listening.